everybody, welcome to Insight Radio. I am your host, Danielle Agnew, and you are a fly on the wall to everywhere. Oh man, sparks are flying. Sparks are flying. In the beginning of 2019, already, and for those of you that follow the work that I put out, uh, we've been talking about the year of reconstruction. We're seeing it all over the place. We still are in the middle of this government shutdown. We've got all Michael Cohen's about ready to testify. We've got all kinds of things happening here. There's a bank here in Montana called Stockman Bank that is offering assistance to any of its members that are government employees, okay, government employees who have had loans with them and who cannot pay those loans because they're furloughed right now. I mean, we've got so much going on. And we have something that I am so excited to share with you, I can barely contain myself. And this is a huge passion of mine that I get to share with you. And it is super important to the last two years of what we've been going through. And it has to do with a massive passion of mine called outer space. I love outer space. I absolutely love it. I wanted to be an astrobiologist. I wanted to be an astronaut. And when I was going to school, when I was 18 years old, I did a lot of theater and won all kinds of national and state theatrical and music awards. So what do you do? Well, you get your full ride scholarship in musical theater and you go to college when you're 18. But if I could go back and do that again, I would have gone into the sciences, right? But what do you know? You don't know much when you're 18. You just don't. And I have to tell you something, gang. I have actually started recording this show that you are listening to twice, and the computer has failed both times, both times. Now, that's a really interesting conundrum because uh, my computer system, it's a quad core. It's very sound. Uh, The engineers that work on this with me are professionals. And we've never had just a seize up, a complete seize up of the computer before ever. I mean, just never. I mean, the program might hitch or whatever, but to have the whole entire computer freeze so that your entire content is just gone, uh, yeah, that's never happened before. But it's happened twice as we've tried to record this show. So that tells me I am on the right track because what I'm going to talk to you about today is huge. It is huge. And it takes a little bit of backstory. So we're going to go back to 2016 because I now have some scientific proof of a phenomenon that I talked about in 2016. And when I brought this phenomenon forward in 2016, it angered a lot of people in my field. It angered a lot of people politically. I had people sending me hate mail saying, how could you even say this? It's not even true. What happened in 2016? Well, for those that follow the work that I put out, you know that I've been talking about the fact that in 2016, we were shoved into a different dimension. We went from the dimension of love and connectivity, and we went to the dimension of fear and chaos, okay? And during the election, while we were watching those numbers coming in, I was watching these numbers come in for Mr. Trump, and they I just felt weird, like I was watching something in another space-time. And I remember turning to the people that I was watching the election with, and I said, does anybody else feel like lightheaded or weird right now? And it wasn't about who was winning the election. It was because I just felt odd, like things were off. And I turned to the people that I was watching the election numbers with, and I said, this is wrong. All these numbers are exactly 2% off. You just watch, not all of them, but there were some coming out of the Rust Belt states in Florida. All of those, those poll numbers were wrong. They were, they were off. They were up by about 2%. And I could feel that in the margins. And I wasn't worried about it because I figured, well, God, if I'm picking this up, somebody's going to see that this, this isn't right. You know, somebody's going to notice that. Well, you know, obviously we go forward. Mr. Trump wins the presidency, whatnot. And the whole time I'm thinking, wow, this is so weird. And I'm feeling, I'm just feeling odd and I'm physically feeling off. And if you think about the 2016 election, when I made that prediction about Hillary winning the election, I literally had looked into our timelines and there was not 
in our timelines, in our scope, there was not one timeline where Mr. Trump won that election. There just wasn't. And it, it wasn't because he didn't, you know, get a good base going and didn't make a splash. It's just he didn't win. So here I'm watching these numbers coming in going, wow, okay, well, you know, I, I don't pretend to be right 100% of the time, and I'm human, and I make mistakes, and I read this one wrong, apparently, and wow, that's crazy. Yet I just remember feeling very sick, a and not sick like, oh gosh, uh, my candidate didn't win sick, because I mean, let's go back to, let's go back to the Al Gore, George W. Bush election. You guys remember that one? And the hanging chad. And, you know, of course, I was really rooting for Al Gore. And I voted for Al Gore. And then he didn't become president because of the hanging chad. And, you know, I was all bent out of shape for maybe a few days, maybe a week. And old GW would come on the TV and I'd give him stink eye for a little while or whatever. But I wasn't sick over it. I mean, I wasn't wrecked over it. And... You know, shoot, I was more upset about, I'm still more upset about my Seahawks losing the flipping Super Bowl on a one-yard line pass that should have been a run, an intercepted pass. Who does that? I'm still more upset about that than, than even this issue with the hanging chat, okay? And why do I bring that up? Because when I felt weird and off and sick and bizarre for weeks and even months after that, other people... We're reporting the exact same thing that I was feeling. And I couldn't figure it out. I mean, okay, it was weird Donald Trump, you know, won. And sure, I was rooting for Hillary. Yet, welcome to America. You know, your a candidate doesn't always win. It's a bummer. You shake it off. You live, you know, you live on with your life. But this felt weird. And it was just off and wrong and odd. And so I really started to look at the other changes that were happening in my life and other people's lives at that time. Okay, so this goes, this is so not an issue of sour grapes, gang. Honestly, I had some other business arrangements that were in process at that time. And they had nothing to do with the predictive element of my work. So it wasn't like, okay, well, she made a crappy prediction on Hillary Clinton and she sucks. So we're not going to work with her. It was not even in that field. Okay, so all of a sudden, all this momentum I had in a couple of other, uh, well, avenues that I do some business in just died. It was weird. And I had friends who had huge business uh, ventures going and co-creative elements going that just died. It's like the momentum was just gone. And the phone calls all of a sudden were being returned and everybody was in this weird spun out haze. And it was well beyond just, gosh darn, my candidate didn't win. I bent out of shape. This guy's a wacko. Oh, well, you know, because it's America. We go on, right? This was weird. So not only was that weird, not only was I sick with these flu symptoms that I couldn't put my finger on, but so was everybody else. I had people calling from all over the United States saying, I have no idea what's wrong with me. I mean, I, I recognize that my candidate didn't win, but I'm just, I'm sick and I can't get out of bed. And it wasn't as much of a depression. I mean, some people got really depressed, but it was another weird phenomenon that was happening. On top of that, all of the angelic information that I that I receive, I was still receiving it, yet it was coming through some really unique channels through the ethers. And it was just as though that our entire incarnation had been bumped in to another vibrational, well, dimension. Because it had. Because it had. So I started getting out there talking about the fact that we just, we just created another dimensional ether and we're in it. Well, I got a lot of flack for that because a lot of people thought I was trying to cover up a bad prediction. Oh, for God's sakes. Good Lord. I've never claimed to be 100% accurate. That's crazy. I was trying to point out a measure of spiritual physics. I was trying to point out that the will, the intention of the human species creates the dimension that we exist in. Because these dimensional ethers are separated from just really, literally, they are separated by vibration. So I want you to think about multiverses or uh, like M theory, you know, or string theory. Uh, don't take my word for it. Go read Stephen Hawking, okay? So you've got these multiverses and they sit right next to each other. Like if you could imagine sidewalks just stacked one right after the other, 
And it would be more accurate to think of them as people movers. You know those flat walkways that move in airports that cover large stretches to get to concourses? They have a ton of them in the Salt Lake City Airport, for instance. So what we've got here is a case of multiverses that are literally separated by minuscule vibrational impulse. So literally, we c- I could put a piece of saran wrap between these dimensional ethers, and that's how flimsy, that's how delicate it is. The only thing that keeps us separate from a dimension either side of our third dimension is the vibration in which most of the human species co-creates and works upon in conjunction with the resonation of the planet, okay? The human species has an amazing, powerful electromagnetic organ called the brain. And when you get nearly 8 billion of us together with that co-created consciousness, that creates a resonation. Brain waves are measurable, all right? So in 2016, prior to that election, Brexit happened. And so the UK was already going heavy nationalism, shut down those borders, not literally, but very anti-immigration, a lot of anger, a lot of, uh, I don't even want to call it conservatism because I think that's almost disrespectful to my conservative friends who I know who are not angry people. So whatever this movement is uh, that's fear-based, okay, it exploded in the UK. And then previous to 2016, we had old Vlad Putin working Russia, like he's been doing, and old Vlad, we can count on you to be consistently crispy over there. So Russia has a large population, and so there is disrest and nationalism over there. And I'm not saying nationalism equates fear, yet in order to promote nationalism, one must bang the fear gong until people buy in. It's part of the marketing tool for nationalism. You can read any dictatorial handbook, It's part of it, okay? Then we also had North Korea really ramping up to do its thing prior to 2016. And old Kim Jong-un pops his head up every once in a while and squawks about whatever he's going to do. Yet it does affect people's thought process. It does affect the fear that we put out into the United States, into the world. So then, speed forward, we had a presidential candidate whose entire platform was built on division, fear, negativity, aggression, bullying. I mean, and we had a lot of people in the country who really resonated with that. And so all of a sudden, in the United States, we're pushing this fear wave that is present all over the rest of the world. Let's not even get going on all of the genocide that happens in Africa that we don't even talk about because we as the United States don't use that country for anything we make money on except for Exxon And that's a whole different, whole different story about how Exxon basically paid off a warlord to get access to their oil over there, which is awful. But anyway, so we're looking at all of this fear that's hitting the ethers in 2016. So what does fear do? Well, fear is on a different frequency than love. And love is a pretty predominant frequency on the earth. You know, human beings just want to love each other. we're, We're a weird species like that. All right. So as we look at how this lays out, what happened? Well, a ton of the human species, all of our brains, not all of our brains, but many of our brains started projecting the fear vibration into the ethers. So it started to wiggle that little piece of saran wrap between our universe and a a corresponding multiverse that's right next to us, okay? So I want you to think about our universe, our known third dimension as being 97.1 on the radio dial. Here we're having this conversation. We are broadcasting on 97.1. Now, fear operates at a slower resonance or wavelength than does love. It takes longer for fear to... Fear will spread quickly, but it dissipates quickly because it's a slower vibration. So we're going to put the fear vibration down at 88.9. All right. So if we're used to being at 97.1 and all of a sudden the earth is hit with a bunch of fear, we, the humans on this earth, pushed us into literally into another dimension. And that dimension was a dimension where fear and chaos was the predominant operating system. 
And I've been saying this since 2016, and I've been catching flack from every direction, but it is the truth. And I'm finally going to present during this podcast this incredible scientific documentation of a dimensional shift. We finally caught it. Thank God. But I knew we had shifted dimensionally because not only was I needing to adjust just a little bit the frequency in which these angels communicated with me, and that took about half a year. That was crazy. That was weird. Not only was I feeling sick and flu-like, and so was everybody else that was calling me, yet I was doing some research on dimensional sickness, or what NASA calls space sickness. And space sickness is what happens when our astronauts go up in space, and they're up in space for quite a long time. And when they're up in space, their bodies come out of the natural biological time clock with the Earth. Because when you're up there, I mean, you're literally going around the earth several times in 24 hours, while it takes 24 hours for the entire earth to rotate. So you come out of that space-time relationship. It's bizarre. Uh, And and you're, you're not the same age as everybody that's on the earth. You literally are younger when you come back by a few days than the people are on the earth. So you come out of space time, you come out of phase. And when these astronauts would come back from their missions, they would be sick. And it would take them a few days, especially the longer they were up there, it would take them a few days to get back into synchronous uh, vibration with the Earth. So they called it space sickness. And it wasn't just about being in a non-gravity environment, which is part of it, because when you're in a non-gravity environment, your heart doesn't work right, your bones degrade. It's also about being having this space-time... Th- continuum and your biological clock interrupted. It makes you physically sick when you get back because you're going from one dimension of space-time to another dimension, okay? These are super-duper cliff notes, but we only have an hour. So basically, everybody is reporting space sickness symptoms in 2016, which include but are not limited to fogginess of the head, body aches, flu-like symptoms, uh, what can be perceived as a depression, Um, No energy whatsoever, loss of appetite, um, nausea, but no vomiting. I mean, all of this is space sickness symptoms, and all of it is symptomatic of a physical wave shift or a dimensional shift. And the reason I've been bringing this up since 2016 is because I have been doing my best to educate all of us that we are what makes the ascension happen. Okay, humanity, we are what does it. We're not sitting here waiting for God to come back and zip the earth and all of a sudden we're all ascended and going home on, you know, the sled that Jesus came down in. We are the ones that raise the vibration of this planet. And when we talk about the vibrational raise, it is a dimensional raise, okay? So just follow me here. So in 2016, we knocked ourselves out of that dimension of love into the dimension of fear and chaos. I was watching these numbers coming in going, that's not even real. Those aren't real numbers. What is that? Somebody's going to figure this out. Well, eventually a mathematician came forward a month or so after the election. You can Google this. And presented evidence. They ran the numbers that in the Rust Belt states and in Florida, those numbers were exactly 2% over the exit polls. And that's exactly what I was feeling. Now, this doesn't make me a rock star. This just makes me observant of the energies that were coming in at that time frame. Okay? So we literally went from a dimension of love into a dimension of chaos. And in that dimension of chaos, it was absolutely possible for Donald Trump to become president. And this is not me covering my butt on a prediction, gang. Obviously, Hillary didn't win. So the predictions, you know, sucks. Okay? However, the one thing I want to put out in that prediction is that I will stand by this one portion of it. Actually, all of it. I'll stand by the whole entire thing. But I really want to stand by this portion of it where I said, there is not one timeline that represents Donald Trump as president. Well, obviously, I'm looking in the current dimension we're in. For God's sakes, I'm not a police scanner. You know, I'm not looking in other dimensions and other possible uh, vibrational outcomes. And I'd never even experienced experienced anything like a dimensional shift before, ever. I didn't even know it was possible for us to do that, even though, even though I mean, I theoretically know it's possible, but I, I didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime. I knew that it was what the ascension was, the other direction going up, 
And maybe we needed to be shown what we could do going down. So again, I'm not saying this. I really want to stress this. I'm not saying this to say, see, see, I was right. He was never supposed to be president. Obviously, he's president. Okay, that's not the issue. The issue is the dimensional shift. The issue is the dimensional shift. So let's get to the most exciting portion of this program. All right. I think this is so interesting. So those of you that have been following the work that I put out, and I'm, I'm choosing to say that instead of those of you that have been following my work, because I honestly don't think this is my work. I snag this stuff off of the universal ticker tape and I present it to you. And so maybe the way in which I organize it could be considered perhaps mine, yet it's not my work. It is just the work that I put out. So those of you that have been following the work that I put out, know that I've been saying for the last two years that we are working at pushing back this etheric barrier and wiggling that little piece of saran wrap so that we could push ourselves back in to the position, okay, of the vibration of love, thus returning to the previous dimension that we exited in 2016. We've been listening to radio signals on 88.9. It's time to get back to 97.1. And if you've been following this work, you'll note that I was talking about the fact that 2018 was a big push. And by 2019, pow, we were going to snap it back into place. So here is the cool piece of information. Between 8 p.m. on January 2nd, just before 4 a.m. January 3rd, the earth was hammered with this huge energetic wave of some kind that people who watch solar feeds had no idea how to identify. And according to the solar observatories, this giant wave that hit the earth did not come from our sun. It did not come from any source that we can physically identify using our known scientific means. Now, if you follow space exploration and space studies and space science, you're going to recognize that we can tell the density of a potential exoplanet's atmosphere by simply evaluating the light bands that reflect back through a quasar, for instance. I mean, we have technologies that are in flipping sane in terms of making determinations about what's in space. Now, of course, we don't know everything there is to know, but we certainly do know a significant amount when it comes to at least making determinations on all kinds of vibrations from slow old radio waves all the way up to extremely high oscillating gamma waves. There are pieces of the spectrum that obviously we don't know how to identify. Yet what this solar observatory picked up, because we have these satellites that just sit out and monitor the sun. We're waiting for the big one, Alice. We're waiting for when the sun barfs out a huge flare, a huge coronal mass ejection that will hammer our magnetosphere so hard that it will rattle the teeth of all of our electronics. So we're watching the sun. Now, what is a magnetosphere, you might ask? Well, the magnetosphere of the Earth is a great big force field, and it is in play because of the magnetic poles of the Earth. If we lost, if the Earth lost its magnetism, and all of a sudden that went away, we'd lose our atmosphere, we'd lose our magnetosphere, and we would just get hammered with every bit of solar radiation that's out there. The magnetosphere is a great big thick bubble that protects the Earth from all of the sun's extreme radiation, and because of our magnetosphere and only because of our magnetosphere, we are not fried on a daily basis on our planet, okay? So it's kind of an important thing. And the magnetosphere, again, is created by the rotation of the Earth. It's created by the magnetic field that is created by the rotation of the Earth in space. So what these solar observatories do is they just take a look at how hard the magnetosphere is getting hammered. They, they watch our shields, as it were, to see how hard we're getting hammered by the sun. Now, what is fascinating is that this particular anomaly that was actually caught on video between 8 p.m. January 2nd, just before 4 a.m. on January 3rd. It kept happening. That's why there's a time stretch there. 
is an unknown anomaly to all of science. NASA hasn't commented on it. No one's commented on it. I think they know what it is. They're just sure as shite not going to say anything because it's going to scare the dickens out of people. What you can actually watch, and I will give you uh, the URL for the video that you can watch this on in just a second here. What you actually watch is this massive wave coming in through the sun, and you watch that wave approach the magnetosphere of the Earth, which represents in this solar observatory's, um, I don't know if they're registering heat or what, what they're registering on this, but it looks kind of like a heat spectrum photography. I don't know what the actual bandwidth is. Yet the magnetosphere is represented by this big red bubble around the Earth. And you see this massive orange wave coming. And it doesn't just hit the magnetosphere. It smashes it. Okay? It smooshes it. Now, you have to consider the magnetosphere is tough. It's really buoyant. Have you ever tried to push together a north and south magnet? They repel one another, right? So what this thing did was smash the Earth's atmosphere, our ionosphere, the magnetosphere. It squished it like squishing a marshmallow. So whatever, the, and it was a huge wave that impacted the front end of the magnetosphere. So think, think about like a backwards letter C, okay? And in the middle of that is the Earth. It impacted the front of it. You see this impact wave just buckle in the magnetosphere. And then you see whatever this wave is go around it and just smoosh it. And as it gets to the back of the earth, you see this massive swirl of chaos in space that is so huge. And the amount of particle disruption is so massive. And it just keeps churning back there and churning back there and churning back there. So I had somebody posting this on my Facebook page because I had made a post saying, hey, if anybody wants to answer or, excuse me, ask any general questions about the earth or whatever, ask and we'll take a look at this. So I looked at this video and I just, my jaw dropped. What we have documentation of now at this point is a massive vibrational wave if you want to call it a gravitational wave, if you want to call it a space-time wave, think of going to put a sheet on the bed when you make the bed, right? And you flick the sheet. You're trying to get it the flat sheet to lay over your queen-size bed. So you flip the sheet, and there's a big ripple that goes all the way down the sheet so it lays flat. What we saw is an interference, a dimensional ripple of us pushing us back into that what I'm going to call the love dimension. And it disrupts space-time. It disrupts particle matter. It would create a ripple so huge that it would disrupt the magnetosphere. So spinning back to 2016, Google that time frame. There were tons and tons of weird uh, communications issues with satellites, with cell phones. There was all kinds of things going weird in 2016 into 2017, right around that time of the dimensional shift. Well, why would that happen? Because all of our electronics, all of our satellites, all of that is dependent upon ricocheting those signals on Earth off of our ionosphere. And the ionosphere sits way up high in the sky. It's, uh, it's under the magnetosphere. But it's literally uh, looks like a, a fishnet, okay? And it, it, if you could imagine stretching a fishnet all the way around the Earth and big diamonds everywhere, yet it has a plasma in it, and that plasma creates a reflective surface. So if I'm trying to call you in Korea, obviously the Earth is round, right? So it's a little hard to go across towers because we don't have any towers in the ocean. So we're going to run out of linear space. So what we've got to do is ricochet those signals up off the ionosphere and come bring them down to the towers uh, in Korea. So what we're looking at when we look at this massive disruption in 2016 is something that disrupted the ionosphere. Now, I don't recall anyone capturing a phenomenon like this in 2016. Maybe they did. Maybe they were looking for it. Maybe they didn't see it. We don't know. However, we have caught it now 
because you literally see this dimensional wave disrupt space-time, smash the magnetosphere of the Earth, which is, abs- again, we're talking the magnetism of the Earth, smashed it flat. I mean, not completely flat, but really compressed it like mad. And the magnetosphere is a massively powerful force. So whatever came through in this giant ripple in space-time was big enough to depla- to dis place magnetism gang now if you're not a, if you're not a physics nerd that may not sound like much but to displace magnetism or to contort it in that way you are contorting the fabric of space that's the only way you can really contort that because we look at gravity waves we look at dark matter as holes in space or troughs in space gravity is the constant Okay, gravity is the constant that we are aware of so far. Pretty soon we're going to get into dimensional concepts and dimensional constants, but we're not there yet as a human species. And I wish, gosh darn it, that I would have gotten my degrees in all of this science because I could go work in this scientific field. And I'm pretty sure that the black ops programs we have are already aware of this stuff. Yet, wouldn't it be nice to have somebody working in these areas for the betterment of humanity instead of weapons research? Just saying. Anyway. So when we watch this dimensional smush happen, and again, you know, that was right at the top of January of 2019, between January 2nd and January 3rd. Uh, Right after that, a lot of people that I know, and myself included, I got the blues like you wouldn't believe. It's like somebody just dumped a bucket of the blues all over my head. And I know Christmas is over, and I love Christmas, and the spirit of peace recedes, and because nobody wants to play with it anymore, and everybody goes on to doing taxes, and it's super depressing. Blah. So yeah, okay, I can be an after Christmas bummer sometimes. However, this was different. I was just plunged into this weird sense of displacement and it was it was insane and that went on through and then we we get up to january 5th and 6th where we have major planetary movement uranus the planet uranus went direct after being retrograde for five months and uranus is the is the planet of revolution and quick change and big new ideas coming in well it's it's been out to lunch for the last five months so that might explain some of the old world modalities that really have gotten subtraction and why we've been like, why is nobody doing anything about this? Well, because Uranus was apparently taking a coffee break. So new world revolution was nowhere to be found. It was like, whatever, man, I'm off duty. I'll be back in a few months. Just chill and learn, chill and learn. So while that's all going on, we also had a solar eclipse and a new moon in that January 5th, 6th time frame. Keeping in mind, we just had a massive dimensional wave come through and nail our ionosphere, okay? So I've also had some friends of mine who have posted on my Facebook page articles about how our magnetic north is trying to take up another predominant position. So this is sort of a sidebar, but Magnetic North currently is sort of the North Pole. It's up around Canada. What they're finding is that Magnetic North is shifting over to Siberia. And the Siberian location appears to be winning over there. Now, it is not unusual for the poles to shift in Earth. It does that about every 600,000 years. And obviously, maybe there's this gravitational dimensional wave thingy that happens that kicks our magnetosphere in the keister, therefore creating a backwards ripple to the planet Earth in the way that our magnetism functions, therefore shifting those poles. Yet it's been trying to move for a while. Yet the North Pole is moving over to Siberia and the Siberian location seems to be winning right now. Which is also really weird because we have a lot of off-worlders that are subterranean in the planet of Earth and going way back to the Atlantis and Lemuria days. And we have some seriously large craft that are underneath the Earth that operate on an electromagnetic tenet that are in the area of Siberia up there. I mean, it's it's a little crazy. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Are they firing all those craft up? Are we helping pull the magnetic center of the earth? Or is this simply just a natural occurrence? Well, it's a little dinky, if you ask me, that this 
poll, this poll issue is going on right at the same time that we're hit by the mystery wave, which, by the way, did not register on any solar observatories anywhere. Not in the ones in the UK, not in the ones in Russia, nowhere, not in the ones in the United States. That weird ripple wave that smashed our ionosphere and literally created chaos in space-time around the Earth is a vibration that we don't know how to identify. Because we don't know how to quantify the shifting of the dimensional ethers between 97.1 and 88.6. Yet what we do know is that consciousness drives vibration and vibration drives which lane of which dimension you're going to flip and be in, okay? So this is not all that out there. If you really just sit back and look at it on paper, none of this is woo-woo. I mean, this is hardcore science. So let me just play for you a snippet of this video where this gentleman who, it is his thing, man, to watch the sun, to watch the sky, to watch the earth. This is his thing. This is a piece from Transpicuous News on January 3rd, 2019, (laughs) entitled WTF was that? You can find this at RTS Earth forward slash 2019. And then it goes on and on from there. Um, you can find this episode, I think, which would be fascinating for you to watch. The host name is Danny Arnold McKenney. And let me just play for you the snip, this particular phenomenon, this dimensional wave. We've snagged the highlights from that broadcast for you, and here it is. Now, you guys all know I have been talking about the solar stuff nonstop for the last couple of weeks. I keep showing that stuff is going on in our magnetosphere, our magnetopause, and it's not solar. It's not solar in origin, or at least the equipment that they use to usually measure these things is not telling us the information we need. So I want to show you 8 of 8 p.m., the first of the major ones. You can see the hit right there. I'm going to take it back and show you, okay? I'm going to take you through this frame by frame. You can watch the wave come in. The entire magnetosphere is literally blasted back. And then watch the reaction. I have never, ever seen anything like that before. Never. No matter how big a geomagnetic storm we've been under, I have never seen anything like this before. I'm going to take you back to see it again because it is literally that crazy. Okay? Speechless. Three o'clock in the morning, it continued. It continued. Now, the arrows are showing you the direction of the wind stream. Again, we're 23. Boom. This massive blast. It is astronomical. And again, it goes on. You can see it's a continuing wave that continues and does not start calming down until right about there, about 340, 350 in the morning. So from 11.50 till about a little after 3.30 a.m., it was a nonstop. Now I'm going to show you up here. This is the magnetopause. Now watch the white line is kind of like our shields, if you will. And you will watch them just crunch, completely crunch under the pressure of this. And at around 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, everything evens out again. Now, here's what I want to show you. This is TSIS. This is the Russian website, the Solar Observatory website. This is your geomagnetic scale. Nothing happened. We're talking nothing happened. Okay, we'll go over here to Solar Ham. Okay, no geomagnetic storms, no radiation storms, nothing. They don't even mention this bauble. It's now the third. Their latest update was January 1st. Okay? 
the solar wind speeds, the protons do show an influx right here at just past 2200 on January 2nd, but nothing else. It is as if we do not, or they, do not even have the equipment to properly measure and tell us what it is that we're seeing. That was not a solar storm. That did not come from our sun, according to the instrumentation we have in place to look at. So what hit the earth? Something massive, massive hit earth yesterday, multiple times. So again, that was from Transpicuous News. You can find that full clip at rts.earth. And the host is Danny Arnold McKenney. And I wanted to include that snip for you so you could hear in that host's own voice as somebody who follows solar phenomenon and space phenomenon about this dimensional wave. Now, I am calling it a dimensional wave because this is corresponding with the time frame of the feminine and corresponding with the time frame where I saw that we were going to just flat up be pushing back on this dimensional wave. And if you have an opportunity to go and check this video out, it is phenomenal if you're a science head to watch just the chaos in outer space. Now, why am I putting this on this podcast today? Well, I'm putting this on the podcast because this is solid, documentable proof on what happens when we raise a vibration. Now, there's many people out there to say, well, this doesn't document a raise in vibration. This is just an anomaly in a space wave that beat the heck out of the you know, ionosphere and magnetosphere, and we don't know what it is. And, okay, fair enough. Yet what I would tell you is that I was seeing that we were going to be pushing back on this dimensional ether, pushing us back into the dimension of love. Okay, pushing us back into that dimension right at the top of 2019, that this was going to be happening at the end of 2018 and into 19. And of course, we've seen a tremendous amount of change in our Congress. And it's not all to do with the government. I mean, keep in mind, gang, the government is a reflection of our consciousness and how much of our consciousness that we want to put down into the ethers and into the ground and into the earth and make real. So I'm not saying that just because we have a democratic, dom, you know, uh, majority that is now dominating the House of Representatives, um, I'm not saying that that's, that's any kind of proof of an ascension process. What I am telling you is that as our consciousness has shifted, we are seeing a pushback, not only in something as simply three-dimensional as the United States government, but we are also watching space-time ripple and bend and have these shock waves that come through. Now, what I think is interesting is if you go back and watch that entire clip, what you see is he talks about these little weird little waves that are kind of like it's like an earthquake in space, uh, like precursor waves, like little shock waves coming up to the big quake that hits, the big tsunami, and then we keep experience ripples and, again, aftershocks of that event, and then it's done. Well, that's just like an earthquake. We know exactly that wave pattern by studying seismologies. Uh, take, studying seismologies take on waves that travel through the earth. You have a little bit of ripple ahead of time, you have the big quake, and then you have the aftershock. So what we see in space-time is the same thing. As we are moving, think about moving the plates of dimensions, okay? We are moving the plates, and as the Earth gets ready to have an earthquake, and the Pacific plate is grinding underneath the North American plate on that western coast subduction zone, as we are watching that happen, we get those little precursor quakes, you know, right before the big one. Because the earth is getting ready to pop and move, and it's incrementally moving. So we see the fabric of space-time doing the same thing. We've pushed, we put enough pressure on our, we're going to call our dimension the 97.1 plate. We've put enough pressure on our 97.1 plate to push it, you know, up against that 88.6 plate or whatever it was at, to force that plate underneath of the 91.7 plate. So it creates this little pre-ripple in space-time fabric. And then, boom! 
boom, the big quake comes as we move over the top of that 88.6 plate or 88.9 plate and we take over or we overlap the dimension of love overlaps the dimension of fear and chaos and bammo, we're snapped back into the dimension of love. And just like an earthquake, which snaps big plates of the earth into place due to different stresses that are put on to the to the the upper skin of the earth's crust, okay? Just like that, our dimensional waves snapped our dimension back into place due to predominant pressure. And we got a chance to actually see it. Now, you know, we have a device on the earth that measures gravity waves. And it would be my guess that perhaps that device, uh, there's a couple of them actually that measure gravity waves in the United States, that those devices picked up a ripple at the same time and a little ping at the same time that this anomaly was registered in space. Except what's interesting is that we can't actually see gravity waves. So whatever this energy was that we don't know how to detect, if we could see gravity waves based upon the same spectrum technology that we've been using, we wouldn't have built these two giant devices, uh, you know, far away from each other on the earth to detect the gravity waves. So this is something we just don't know how to quantify. I'm going to call it a dimensional wave because it's absolutely positively 100% lining up with the timeline that these angels had shown me that we were going to push back enough on that ether, on that little piece of transparent saran wrap that goes between those ethereal barriers. And we were going to push back enough to snap us back into the dimension of love. So what does that mean for us in this current timeline? Well, I get so excited about this stuff, I can barely talk. I just, my brain's racing a mile a minute. And I'm trying to translate this information into a way that first doesn't put you to sleep. And secondly, shows you the potential, the potential of the human species when we get together in like-minded consciousness. Now, we're not talking hive mind people. We're not saying that everybody on this earth needs to think the exact same thoughts so that everybody is on the exact same page. That's not at all what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is like-minded consciousness, the vibration of kindness, the vibration of love, the vibration of compassion. These are all bandwidths. They are wavelengths. They are frequencies, okay? And these frequencies, when tuned in and mass through the bio unit known as humanity, because we are all connected as a human species, we are Bluetoothed together. It's one of the most amazing naturally occurring evolutionary kinks in the human biological development is that we are literally connected to one another energetically and telepathically and emotionally. This is why when we had off-world races come here tens of thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, from Sirius AB star system, from the realm of Otur, the Oturan, or what we call Arcturians, when we had all of these incredible cultures in our galactic communities coming in, to help Earth, they made a pit stop here, not only because our planet is a major jump point due to the fact that it's a massive electromagnet, and we do have a lot of incredible vortexes here that act as an LAX, okay? What we're seeing is that these beings also left a lot of knowledge here. They left a lot of knowledge. And the Oturan focused massively in the areas off of China and Japan. The Sirius AB folks were hitting it up all around in Egypt and in the Maya Plateau and the Incans. I mean, these star communities were attempting to come and assist us as a species because our natural design, our evolutionarily, our evolutionary design is to be synchronized with one another. And they thought it was pretty cool because we're not a hive mind. We are individuals, yet we experience life as a bio-unit. 
Think about that a minute. We are individuals, yet we experience life as a bio unit. And our off-world communities, even though they have been in play for some of these hundreds of thousands of years past our own evolution at this time, some of these communities have been there for millions of years prior to us. I mean, we are literally the Titsi fly of the galaxies. I say that all the time. By galactic timelines, our, our lifespan down here, gang, is like 24 hours. It's hilariously short. And there's a reason for that too, but that's a different podcast. So our off-world communities thought that we as an evolved species being an individualized thinking individual, yet a bio unit of connected thought, they found this dichotomy to be so fascinating that they understood that if we actually got unified, and I don't mean hive mind unified, I don't mean we all have to agree, yet if our frequencies could be in a general range of the same type of kindness and compassion and love, we could literally, literally ascend this planet. I mean, you look at traditional religion, and I'll, I'll pick on the Christian religion here just because that's what I was raised in. So I know the most about that world religion than any others. Yet you look at the Christian religion and it talks about the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. And if we consider that we are a bio unit that is connected to one another spiritually or energetically, if you don't believe in God or spirit, if you consider that we are energetically connected to one another, then what literally would represent a, quote, second coming of Christ? Well, the Christed consciousness was love, kindness, compassion, and the assistance of those who need it. It wasn't a church franchise. It wasn't a religion. It was a consciousness. And we saw that Christed consciousness come through the Buddhas. We saw it come through the Vishnus. We saw it come through many books. We saw it come through the prophet Muhammad. We saw that Christed consciousness pop up all over the place. I happen to know about Jesus because that's how I was raised. So if you look at this and you think, okay, well, maybe I'm a biblical literalist. Maybe the second coming of Christ really is going to be Christ coming out of the clouds and reigning over the earth. Or since we are a bio-connected species, maybe we just decide that having a connection on compassion, love, and kindness is the greatest (sighs) collective decision we can make if we're going to survive. Maybe this is just base biology. Base biology saying, gang, we need to survive. We need to survive a planet that's changing. And to do that, we can't kill each other off. And to do that, we can't hate each other because we plummet ourselves into a dimension of fear and of chaos. Maybe our biology, our DNA, is made to work with our collective biosphere of consciousness to transmit the greatest frequency that can heal and uplift our species. Maybe the design of what we are is enough. And if we would just get out of the flipping way of our design and let our design happen and let our desire to help someone who's drowning in a river, let our desire come forward to help those that are in camps at the border, let our desire come forward to compassionately deal with people who are killing others and say, hey, that's not okay. We need to stop that. And we watch the dimensional attributes that come forward. Maybe that is nirvana on the earth. Maybe that is the second coming of Christ. Now, considering I haven't had lunch with Jesus and haven't asked him directly about what the scoop is, I'm not going to portend to speak for God. Yet what I will say to you all, is what I do is observe minute little teensy wiggles in the energetic fields and the etheric realms. That's what I do. I mean, you could think of me like a seismograph. You could think of me like a translator. Yet sometimes when you come forward with this information and there isn't enough supporting documentation, you, you really do sound a bit like a nut. 
And I get that. I mean, there might even be some of you listening out there going, okay, whatever. This is a space anomaly. It's not a dimensional ripple. Whatever, Danielle. I get where you're coming from, and it's interesting to think about, but we still don't have enough definitive proof. Well, you're correct. We still do not have enough definitive proof. Yet for somebody like me who works with the angelic realm, and these angels said, and I'm paraphrasing, hey, buckle up, 2019, she's going to take right off on you. And it's going to be all about evolution. It's going to be about recreation. It's going to be about reconstruction. It's going to be about pulling what we want to see into the world. Your whole world's going to change. The old world is dead. The new realm is upon you. The great mother has arisen. The old world has passed away. And they're showing me that corresponding with the top of 2019. And I felt that dimensional ripple in 2016. I watched people's lives dissolve away in certain parts of their life that were going strong and they just disappeared. And no, it wasn't because we had an unexpected president. Technically speaking, those folks' businesses should have soared because we had the business mogul in office. So it wasn't about that. It was about the reality that was supporting those actions in co-creative love just disappeared. And we got moved into the dimension of fear and chaos. And obviously, we needed to learn a lesson about our collective ability to change this planet. Think about this. This is so much more than an election. This is so much more than documentation shot out in space. This is, in my ability to put this forward to you, this is proof of our ability to create a dimensional shift. And gang, hear this. We can shift it up in frequency, and for God's sakes, we can sure shift it down. So let's not shift it down anymore. So 2019, I'm not saying we just ushered in nirvana. Uh, It's more like we kind of put us back to where we were. But now we're not even exactly back where we were because we've had two years of changes. So we're back in the dimension that supports kindness, love, co-creation, right action. We are in the time frame of the grandmothers. We are in the time frame of bringing all of us together for the good of what we are capable and and, and now we can see that we can alter space-time. Of course we can. How do you think that the ninjas used to literally go invisible? How do you think they did that? Do you think it's all lore that that didn't actually happen? Well, I got news for you. Any of us with enough command of our frequency and vibration can go out of phase with this current third dimension. And that out of phase thing that happens, we can snap right back in phase. I have a really good friend, Roy. Roy's like my brother from another mother. Uh, And you probably will have seen Roy, Roy Pack, on uh, Facebook with me. I ran a record label with him for a while. He's the crazy guy wearing a kilt in many pictures with me. He's married to a wonderful lady named Beth. And Roy practices Qigong. And I've actually witnessed Roy going invisible and walking right up behind me and reappearing. And it it's unnerving as hell. And he, like I said, he's like my brother from another mother. So he thinks it's really funny. He just laughs. You know, I'm like, that's not funny, man. He's like, you know, you could do it too. I'm like, I don't want to do it. It's kind of creeping me out, okay? Obi-Wan Kenobi, what the hell? So, I mean, literally, this is possible. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. And it's a frequency, people. And why am I talking so excited on this podcast? Because I am excited and I am not ashamed of how excited I am because we are beginning to just barely understand that the shifting, conscious shifting of our frequencies, our thoughts, let me make this super simple in the last minute we have. Watch your thoughts, put them in kindness, put them in possibility, put them in joy. Okay, do the best you can to work outside of yourself for a cause larger than yourself. 
If you're working in the political field, please come out of anger. Uh, you know, the days of being hate- hateful and angry at everybody who doesn't agree with you are really in the rearview mirror. And it pushes us right back to that god-awful dimension we just came out of. And I am telling you folks, I'm going to do everything I can to keep us out of that dimension. I have been working tirelessly since 2016 to get us out of that dimension because I knew what had happened. And the only way that we could get out of it is to collectively become aware and loving and compassionate again. That was it. And I mean, I'm certainly not the only one working towards that. There are millions of us out there working for this. So as we go forward, share this information with as many people as you know who actually will comprehend it, okay? Share this podcast because once people understand what we're capable of, And how amazing this is. It actually is a lot harder to cast us into a slower resonation dimension than it is to uplift us into a higher dimension resonation. Why is that? Because we are indigenous to the realm of light. Light is a very fast traveling frequency. Gamma rays are amongst the fastest traveling frequency of all in the light spectrum. So we're talking a very high vibration indigenously. And that's what our spirits are made out of, or our souls are made out of. So we are these high vibrational creatures tethered to a third dimensional, which is a little slower, environment, which is a giant spinning electromagnet. Do you know what that makes us? That makes us the most effective galactic planner array for love and change in our quadrant of the galaxy which is exactly why these off-worlders have even bothered stopping to say howdy, because they know what we are. We just don't. So let us co-create majesty, miracles, kindness, provision for all. Let us co-create a dimension of ease. Let us co-create a dimension where we no longer need to judge those who choose a lesson in fear. Let us recognize the divine appointment for what we truly are within our spirit and within our DNA. And let us be joyful in accessing this incredible superpower because this is who you truly are. And we only get there by working together. May you all have a blessed week. Let this sink in. Go share it with folks. And I will see you next week.